All right. So like I've said in the past, uh, no really bad words for a minute here. <laughs> uh, let's uh, let's give a few more folks some time to come on. Hey, Bevan, how are you? Good. How's it going, Keith? Good. Are you? Did you get healed up, buddy? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I got the I got the old COVID after dodging it for two for two years. Man, and, uh, that that was fun. Oh, I'm so sorry, bud. Good times, but no, it's 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 fine. It wasn't too bad. <laughs> Good times, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on here, bud. Hope you're doing better. Hey, Arnie, how are you, buddy? Good. Hi. Can you hear me, Keith? Yes, I can. You're doing good. You're in a car this time or something. <laughs> My wife's car. <laughs> Make sure she wants to say hello to everybody. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Make sure you get that right. It's your wife's car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Awesome. Well, gosh, thank you guys, all of you, for joining us. Uh, Diane, the audio's I, on now. Did I say, oh, good, Bridget. Yeah. Uh, Diane, did I say hello to you? No, this is my first meeting. Hi, everybody. Oh, Hi, awesome. Diane. Awesome. We'll get a chance. Hi. We'll get a chance to talk to you in a little bit, okay? Okay. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. You don't have to. <laughs> It's going to be fine. Thank you for joining us, by the way. Okay, yeah. It's easier yeah. for me to see you without my glasses. <laughs> okay. You do not want to look at this mug. And Michael, don't you say a word. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> uh, I hope you have your, uh, your friend joining you today, buddy. Yes, I do. I just, oh. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh my gosh. Hi, Abby. Hi, Keith. How are, how are you? I'm okay. My leader here uh, told us about this meeting, so I figured I'd sign on for a bit. Ooh, it's me. Which leader? Was it Michael? It was Michael, the oh, leader. No. <laughs> oh, no. Oh. <laughs> we love it. Well, we're glad you're on here. Thank you for joining us. Um, now, today, you guys, uh, real quick, I want to say a couple of quick things. I am running the show because um, the uh, some of the folks at SAO couldn't join today. So um, I'm just going to run it. And so if I have a little hesitation here and there, please bear with me on that. Uh, and I am recording this, so just so everybody knows that uh, we like to do that so that we can send it out to all the stroke survivors out there and, um, you know, make sure we're making an impact for people and, and helping everybody understand that they can continue to grow, uh, get better, um, have belief in themselves, all of that. So uh, and as I join some more people here. Anyway, um, so thank you guys so much for, for joining us today. Um, today we're having Dr. Blaze Morrison join us. Uh, what a great guy he is. And he always looks so young. I, it drives me crazy. <laughs> thank you. He looks like he's uh, 18. Do I get an amen on that one? Keep bringing it. Keep bringing it. I'll, I'll take all of it. We have to put up with the hierarchy. <laughs> well, that's your problem, Michael. <laughs> no, and what a fantastic uh, guy he is. He, we've had him speak once before, and it was awesome. One thing I would ask is for everybody to know that when we get a group like this, sometimes it gets a little loud. It can, you know, we can have some things. So if you can, if you have some background noise or something going on, please hit the mute button. And, uh, and then we're going to get to a lot of question and answer today too, because uh, I kind of gave uh, Dr. Morrison a, a heads up that that's what today's going to be about. So, um, I thought what we should do today 
is, oh, hang on. I thought what we should do today is um, start with you, Blaze, and have you kind of tell us a little bit more about what you do and how you got started down this road. And, um, you know, just, and then we'll, we'll move into some question and answer, and we're just going to kind of go with the flow today. But I want, I want, if, if we can, I'd like for you to give us some input about how you got into your business and what you're doing these days. So I think that's important for all of us to hear. Sure, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, well, thank you everyone for letting me come and, uh, and, and speak at your group. I always appreciate uh, the warmth and the family-like atmosphere uh, of this group. Uh, and I guess I'll just start by giving a little background to myself. So I am um, a, a rehabilitation uh, psychologist and a rehabilitation counselor and a mental health counselor. So I have a few different disciplines that I ascribe to. Um, I am from Northern Ohio, so uh, Toledo, Ohio. So uh, coming down south was a, was, a, was a culture shock for me a little bit, but we love the area that we're living in. Um, I, uh, I worked for uh, a few years. I got my master's degree in, uh, in mental health and rehabilitation counseling, and then I worked um, three different jobs for a number of years that included uh, primarily doing uh, mental health counseling with people that were struggling with substance abuse. Um, I was uh, a vocational rehabilitation counselor for individuals with mental health disabilities and psychiatric disabilities. And I was also a crisis, uh, crisis worker, which uh, meant that I basically would be called out at all hours of the night or morning to assess whether individuals were suicidal, homicidal, or, or actively psychotic, and then would make a determination whether or not um, they could, uh, whether or not they could uh, go home with a safety plan or whether they'd need to be hospitalized. Um, and so that's my early days started off in that, in that area. And then I worked there for some years doing doing those things and then i uh i knew i always wanted to go back and do my my phd uh because i wanted to to work in an academic setting and so i got my phd in rehabilitation psychology and basically what rehabilitation psychology is is uh it's it's you know we do what psychologists do except the focus is on individuals with chronic illness and disability so mm -hmm. um and part of going into that was part of my own personal experience growing up with um, a father who had schizophrenia and a number of other physical disabilities and a mother who had serious mental health issues and chronic uh, illness and uh, another uh, and a number of other sort of medical disabilities. Mm -hmm. Seeing the relationship, you know, between mental health, and physical disability and its impact on the family is sort of what drove me down uh, the path I'm in now, um, which is is working with people with co-occurring medically complex problems. So, um, you know, the individuals that don't fit neatly into diagnostic boxes, those are my people. So, uh, you know, individuals that have had stroke or brain injury, um, but who are also experiencing uh, you know, depression, anxiety, or other <laughs> severe mental health issues. Um, and uh, and uh, working with families, working a lot with caregivers and caregiver burden and caregiver stress um, is also uh, another thing that I do. Um, and mm. so that, that family work, working with the family, not just the individual, but working with the family is, is, sort, is what I do now. It's what my passion is. And I primarily, I facilitate support groups just like Keith does, um, but I also see families and individuals in, uh, uh, separately to do basically what we would consider, you know, uh, mental health counseling or psychotherapy. Um, but I focus, I specialize in working with individuals uh, primarily that have a brain injury or a post-stroke. I also work with 
individuals with spinal cord injury and other disabilities, but brain injury and stroke are, are really the two main populations that I work with. And if, as most of you know, after the onset of a stroke, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of emotional, psychological adjustments. Um, there's a lot of family stress. There's a lot of changes in your world. And so I'm, you know, having someone that can help sort of uh, support you during those, those transitions to living with disability or post-stroke um, is, is, is what I do. That's, that's sort of uh, what my main, my, my, my main shtick is. Um, I do a lot of other things. I do research. I'm a researcher. So, uh, you know, I have grants that I do research on uh, in a number of areas. I teach in a master's level counseling program. Um, and uh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of other little things. Oh, that's awesome, bud. I'm not kidding you. That's incredible. And before I open this up to question and answer, and on a day like today, I'd like to get people to raise their hand or put their little mark up, uh, which would help for sure. But um, a couple of things I had, and, and um, not to take the ball, but I want to offer a couple of things. Uh, one thing we started talking about was spasticity and uh, chronic pain before. And we were talking about that in our last meeting, we ran out of time. And so I wouldn't mind if you kind of delved into that a little bit, and then maybe we can have some question and answer for that. And then, uh, and then we'll move forward with that. Did you have any comments, Blaze, to start with? Um, is there a, a, a specific aspect of spasticity or chronic pain that you you know, that you wanted me to address or. Um... And, and I'm not certain. I, I apologize. I, Glenda, I think it might've been you. And if so, would you type a thing in the message and anybody else have questions specific to those items that we can, that we can talk about with Blaze to start with, and then we'll just open it up to whatever questions might come up. Um, are, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, this is Glenda, and uh, I have spasticity and chronic pain, and I'm trying to deal with those issues, and I haven't been able to find any pain medication that um, really does much for the, for the pain, um, and I'm looking into a couple of things, and I, I think at the last meeting that Kim mentioned uh, pregabalin, and I'd never heard of that. I um, was on uh, gabapentin for you know a number of years. I didn't think it was really doing anything for me, and I stopped taking it quite a while ago. But I just like to hear from anybody that's just um, dealing with spasticity uh, and chronic pain, and um, how, how they how they deal with it. Please go ahead if, if, if you have any comment on that. Sure, uh, I, you know, and of course I'm always interested in hearing what other individuals coping styles are with that. Uh, you know, I, of course, you know, I'm gonna come from a more psychological, emotional standpoint um, on this topic. Cause that's, I'm, you know, cause I'm a psychologist. So I won't be able to speak as much to the medical aspects of it or the medication aspects of, of it. Um, uh, but I know that, you know, with spasticity and chronic pain, you're talking about two, um, two aspects of, 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 you know, stroke rehabilitation or, or ongoing symptoms that are highly correlated with uh, anxiety and depression, uh, of course, for a number of reasons, um, you know, chronic pain and spasticity limit you from, you know, social engagement, social activities, being able to do the things that you used to do. Um, and in terms of, you know, treatments for it, I, I can't really say that I would be able to give good medication recommendations. Um, you know, I could just sort of throw out suggestions um, 
that that have been utilized and, and tend to be, you know, and can be good, but may not be good for you. So I would always say go through your doctor first. But um, uh, CBD is, is something that has been, um, you know, potentially useful in chronic pain and spasticity. Um, but also, uh, you know, it, it, it really depends on, I always, I always say the caveat is, is that uh, there's a lot of products out there that are poor quality. Um, and, and it tends to be that, uh, you know, the CBD that tends to be higher quality costs a lot. Uh, so I just send that caveat. Um, and it may or may not be helpful, you know. Um, I, I often, uh, you know, think that with spasticity too, it's um, working, you know, and I know this is probably, you know, talking to the choir here, but, uh, but uh, you know, following through with your physical rehabilitation, occupational uh, therapy, um, all of those elements of working, working the muscles and, 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 you know, working, uh, you know, sort of rebuilding those neuronal connections can be helpful too. Um, uh, oh, I saw yoga. I just want to say yoga. Uh, I'm glad someone put yoga down there because yoga is, of course, something that can also be uh, helpful. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and Blaze, let's. I want to move this to Kim. Kim has a, a com. She wants to comment on this. Um, you're really hitting on some things that get the wheels turning for everybody here. So Kim, go ahead, please. So I have had spasticity with the, I don't call it pain. I call it uncomfortability. I don't like the idea of the word pain because pain to me, like when I fractured my hip, uh, oh my gosh, that was just screaming out pain. But with my stroke, I'm uncomfortable. I have a pulling up, you know, from my shoulder up into my neck. My ribs have never been the same. I hurt so much in my ribs. And so stretching, I'm going to say, you know, is so very important. One of the things I found about the stretching when I did it, you know, I realized I didn't trust the OT. And because she was stretching, it was hurting. And then I realized I had to say out loud, I'm afraid you're going to hurt me because mm -hmm. there's a fear involved because it hurts when you get start being moved, but it's so good. And if you can just breathe through that pain, it is not pain that's going to hurt you. It's the pain that's going to help you. So I will say stretching is incredibly important for I also now go to a chiropractor and I just came back from her. And one of the things that's that's so good is that she keeps me in alignment because my alignment keeps getting thrown out because of the pulling. You know, the thing that spasticity is, is that our, we grab, it's that grabbing and we don't have, we've lost, at, doesn't mean it never will come back. But for the ones that are suffering spasticity, it is because the brain has lost that connection to release it. Mm -hmm. So I take baclofen and I also take, pregabalin is the generic of Lyrica. And um, that's what my neurologist gave me. And I've, when I've gone off it, it's not been good. I have, I have stuff in my sensitivity that I, when I'm off of it, I feel all this weirdness under my eye. And, I, you know, so I just keep taking it and it dulls it, but the stretching and you got to work out. It's no. like the antithesis of what you, I'm sorry, Glenda, did you want to say something? Yeah, Kelly Hendricks. Oh. Sorry, my sister called in. <laughs> Glenda, did you want to say something? Well, um, I my stroke was six years ago, so I've done um, PT over the years, and I do stretching. I do things every day. 
Uh, I haven't done any water therapy, and that's something that I probably should try. Yes. But, um, you know, I've really been through the ropes, and I, the, just the last couple of years, for some reason, the spasticity increased, um, and uh, my stroke uh, affected my right side, which is my dominant side. And so I have so many questions, I guess. Um, does anyone know, is spasticity likely to get root, uh, worse over years? I had never heard that until one neurologist happened to just offhandedly say it to me. And I, I've never heard that. Um, as Glenda, far, uh huh, sure. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just going to, and I didn't mean to interrupt you, frankly. Um, I thought you were done. I, I apologize. But um, I want to give Blaze an opportunity to, to visit on that. And um, before he does, I, I, I want to see if, Blaze, do you have any thoughts on the mental side? of that as well and uh, the progress that somebody can make if they choose to do so. Yeah, so uh, uh, of course we, there's a lot of science on the, you know, the psychological aspects of chronic pain because chronic pain and the way we experience it is of course um, influenced by how we perceive the disability but also how we perceive pain. And, um, and there's this term in, in the literature and science and, you know, in, in the medical world called pain acceptance. And pain acceptance is uh, basically this idea that some people with higher pain acceptance will accept the pain is there and will still go forward um, or accept the spasticity is there and will still go forward doing Acti you know, the things that they enjoy doing. Um, and, and, and that tends to have a positive effect, right? Like doing things that, are, that you want to do despite the pain. And then there's other individuals, right? And it's, this isn't, you know, this is influenced by a lot of stuff. It's not like some are better than others, but there's some that have lower pain acceptance. Mm -hmm. And what that is, is that there's a ten there can be a tendency to ruminate and think uh, so much about how the pain is going to impact you or how it's going to impact you over the long term and that, oh, I'm never going to be able to do this again. And, and you sort of get out of being the, in the mindful present and you start to think about all the ways in which pain is going to destroy your life. Mm -hmm. And that tends to then uh, make it more likely that you'll experience anxiety and depression and isolate more which actually brings on more depression and can bring on greater perceptions of pain. So it's a really interesting thing, but I would say one of the most important things, and if just from a clinical standpoint is, if you have the pain and spasticity, despite that, still engaging in those parts of your life, your responsibilities, you know, the things you enjoy, still doing that, because ultimately the psychological benefits of doing those things uh, in the long in the long run, will will be help, more helpful than um, you know ruminating or focusing on the pain and uh, you know and avoiding activities and avoiding things that you enjoy. And Glenda, uh, are you not working still at the paper? Uh, I don't work. I'm retired. I'm seventy five. Okay. I'm so sorry. I got you mixed up with someone else, and I my apologies on that. Okay. So, um, what what are your thoughts? Quick thoughts about what Dr. Morrison said. Oh well, I I couldn't agree more, and um, I do uh, work through it. I mean, I I, I live alone, and I I uh, go ahead and do whatever I have to do, even though I'm in pain. Um, I find it very fatiguing, um, you know, and like a lot of us, I have to make a block of time. I'm going to go do my grocery shopping. Well, then 
I'm not going to do a, another big project that day. And so I do work through it um, pretty well. It is a good reminder um, uh, that he gave us about um, still getting out there and doing things that you enjoy and the uh, psychological benefit, uh, especially I have depression, I've had it for a long time. And so that's a good reminder for me because I tend not to do that. Um, so uh, those, those are my comments. For okay, now. thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. I really appreciate that. And, and something came to my mind I'm going to ask this question of everybody, and if you can, just raise your hands if you, if you don't mind. How many, how many in this room, it takes two to three times longer to do something that you did pre-stroke than it does now? Yes. Okay. So listen, we, you know, we had a stroke, and some of us are, are worse than others. Some of us are closer to when we had our stroke. And it's going to take some time and it sucks. Okay. Uh, you go through whatever you go through. We've all been through a lot of crap, but um, you are going to get better. And one of the things that drives me crazy, and I know you guys have all heard it before, but you know, when I left and the neurologist says to me, you got about, you know, a year, year and a half as good as it's going to get. And that is totally wrong. And so continue to work uh, and continue to work on your own growth and what it is that you want in life. And uh, it will continue. And I'm sorry, a little station break there, Blaze. Uh, but that is excellent stuff. Steve Van Houten, go ahead, buddy. Uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, Morrison, um, I also have a vocational rehabilitation background and uh, have done that most of my life and had a stroke three years ago that left uh, my left side uh, having loss of sensation but no loss of strength. And I was wondering if we could define um, spasticity in terms of symptomatology. Um, and because there's a whole lot of different things going on I don't experience pain, I experience uncomfortableness. Um, I have a loss of proprioception, which has come back fairly uh, well. I have a loss of dexterity on my left side. I certainly have a loss of sensation, uh, but I don't, and I do have some restricted or tightness in muscle movement but I don't have, but I'm able to use my left side. So I'm just wondering if, if all of that falls into the category of uh, 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 spasticity uh, by definition, or if not, do we need to define this differently? Go ahead, Blaze. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know if I can fully answer your question uh, just because spasticity could be defined differently across different, you know, areas, but I, I traditionally just associated it with, you know, a uh, spastic muscle response, uh, you know, muscle spasms, um, you know, um, that uh, they cause tension, they cause pain. Um, but, but I, I'm sure they manifest differently. Uh, they do manifest differently across different people. Um, so I, I, you know, I think, um, yeah, I, I guess I don't know what to say more than that. You know, that's Steve, sort of just my traditional. Let, let me jump in here for a second, Steve. So you, you said something about proprial perception, yeah. is that correct? Proprial perception, knowing where your limbs are in space without seeing them okay so well i didn't know yeah. but that would be like that wouldn't be housed under spasticity it wouldn't. i don't know if that's that no that wouldn't that wouldn't okay. yeah spasticity i you know and just from my understanding is more of the physical experience of spasms muscle spasms 
uh, which, you know, could be rigidity and tension and pain. Um, but the uh, proprioception is more, uh, you know, a, a cognitive. Okay. Uh, sort of so would it, would it also be then uh, involuntary movements rather than something like loss of sensation or loss of dexterity? Um, so you're, you're talking about maybe muscle movements that are involuntary. Basically, Is that yeah. What you call spasticity? That's what I've. That's what I call it. You know, that's sort of how I I um have always referred to it. But I do again. I I want to. I'm actually. So I just look. I just want to make sure the formal definition, according to the National Institute of Neurological Disorders, is that spasticity is a condition where there is an abnormal increase in muscle tone or stiffness of the muscle, which might interfere with movement, speech, or be associated with discomfort or pain. Can I uh, jump in here uh, just a moment? Sure, Glenda, go ahead. Um, my spasticity, I don't have any problem with proprioception. And uh, my spasticity is just causes my muscles to be very tight. And so I do the stretching, uh, but there is kind of a tremor too. For example, when I go to, to eat and put the spoon up near my mouth, you know, it, it will jerk. And, and uh, so, so but mostly it's, I mean, I still have some strength in my hand but the sensation, um, sensitivity is, is dulled as, as well. So that's kind of explaining my, uh, my spasticity. So you can't carry a cup of hot coffee in your left hand? Uh, it affected my right, so no, oh. I, can't, uh, I can't carry right. hot coffee. That's the way I am too, uh, except it's reversed. This is the right hand. Yes. Okay. Well, real quick here, and I, I want to make sure that we're staying on, on target. And thank you, Glenda, and thanks, Steve, too. Uh, those are fantastic stuff. And, and you know, a lot of this stuff isn't uh, black and white, right? I think we all know that. And so it depends on the person and, and all that. But um, Dr. Morrison, um, is there, I guess, let, let me back up. Let me say it this way. Are there any other questions that, you know, we can just move into and let uh, Dr. Morrison continue to answer? I'm sorry, I kind of lost my train of thought there for a second. So who's got another question? So tell me, no Dr. Book. Morrison. I'm sorry. That I'm an open book. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us more about when you're working with some of the survivors out there. Okay. okay. Uh, of course, no names and all that, but give us some examples of what you're doing that would help those people move forward after the after their stroke, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, well, gosh, it, it obviously varies depending on a lot of things, but I mean, a com common things that I work with are, are relationships, couples mm. post-stroke, you know, cause obviously the relationships um, cha can change substantially. And, you know, and sometimes the change with your spouse to being more of where the spouse takes on more of a care partner, a caregiver role, you know, that can affect uh, just the dynamics of your relationship. Um, yeah. You know, communication uh, can be obviously affected. And if there's, you know, the presence of, you know, depression, which we know is, is very common post-stroke and anxiety, you know, these things tend to uh, interfere with their important relationships. So that's one aspect that I might help with uh, helping, you know, the individual cope better, but also the, the care partner to be able to know how to respond and cope better as well. Um, and, and, and maybe, you know, understand how to be a support uh, and, and how to be an advocate for that person. I love that. I love it. 
uh, and I'll, I'll take, you know, I'll comment on that for a second. So um, one of the things that my wife was told shortly after my stroke was by a, a woman who her father had had a stroke and his um, mom or her mother uh, never allowed him to speak uh, interrupted all the time and just kind of took control, which is something that people would do, right? I mean, trying to, you love that person, you're trying to help them. And so they just kind of took over. And so she told my wife, uh, she said, you know, do not do that. You've got to let him, you know, work on himself. You got to let him find his words and all that and, and all those things. And to me, that was a huge piece of the pie and letting uh letting your stroke survivor you know talk more now on the caregiver side and then we'll open this up i don't think <laughs> we all love our our spouses and those who take care of us uh we've got to remember how important it is to make sure we're um bringing it out, making sure they know how much we love and appreciate them, making sure that they know how important they are in our lives. Because as a stroke survivor, a lot of times we get in our own heads, we're thinking about, you know, how do we get better? How do I overcome whatever? And we tend to um, just get in this, and I'm no different, we get in this funnel and we, we forget to give our spouse um, or caregiver, whoever it is, credit that they deserve. And so um, I think that's a fantastic thing that you're, you're doing, Blaze. And I, I, I'd love to hear more from other people here, please. Anybody got a question for Dr. Morrison or anything else that he might say? We gotta have some conversation. Uh, yeah, I got I got a question. Um, so it's been recommended to me before, um, you know, by a therapist that I um, and I don't know maybe multiple people to to get into um, meditative practices. And I know it's not, you know, I know it's kind of like a muscle, and, and it's not gonna be perfect the first time, and it's not gonna be. It's not going to be probably perfect the hundredth time, but um, I, yeah, I don't know. I guess um, maybe if I had some tips on like, I mean, I get the, I, you know, I, like I can hear, I can hear all the, I mean, all the potential benefits and everything of it, but it may be like, but I tend to not be able to, to get into things or, or practice them very well without uh maybe having some like some little short-term goals to achieve like 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 I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing to like I'm not talking about getting to, to from A to Z I'm just talking about getting from like A to B you know what I mean can do you have any suggestions sure in 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 terms of you mean with meditation in particular yeah, because that, I'm, yeah, I don't know, like people have recommended that to me time and time again. And I think it's kind of that whole theory of like, um, yeah, like, um, like, even if you, you know, you, even if you know why you feel the way you do, like, it, it doesn't, it doesn't really determine like how the way you feel the way you do like you know what i mean so right. i i guess because of, because of that i don't know they've recommended i do some meditative practices yeah well i will just go in and say that um you know meditation and then i i always say that you know mindfulness which is a form of meditation um are you know are of course supported heavily in terms of of being effective um uh, but the, the, you know, there's usually people love it or people just really have difficulty doing it. And for people, and this is just sort of a truth that I've, that I've come across, it, it can, for people that all, that tend to already have, you know, maybe a go, go, go personality, 
um, and I'm not saying, you know, I don't know anyone here, so I don't know, but, or more anxious, it's actually harder to do, to sit down and really do mindfulness and meditation because there's a, there's this sense that I need, you know, I need to fill my mind up with something, or we start to say there's a right way to do this, right? Like, and I'm not doing it the right way, right? And I'm not supposed, you know, I'm, and, and, and that sort of goes against what it actually is, which huh. is, um, well, one is you can't, you can't, you know, you can't do uh, meditation mindfulness, you know, uh, poorly, right? It's, 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 it's not a good or bad, you know, practice. It just is. And, and that's sort of what the idea behind meditation is, and mindfulness is that just like any other thing that you will practice over time, and this is the key, is that meditation and mindfulness has to be practiced as part of your daily routine. It's not something, you know, that, that will sprinkle in a little bit here or sprinkle in a little bit there. Um, it really needs to be consistent to get the long-term benefits. And that's because what, you know, just like you said, it's a muscle, just like if I went to the gym and was bench pressing, right? By the end of the year, I'm going to, you know, be able to lift, well, hopefully a decent amount of weights, right? Um, meditation mindfulness is a, is, is a cognitive brain exercise. And uh, the initial time you, you, you try it, you know, uh, there may be a lot of things going on in your, in your mind and you can't focus and it's hard to sit still. And, but the idea is that over time with continued practice, your brain will develop new connections, right. That will allow you to be present longer. Right. Um, and if you think about it, right. Anxiety is, is us focusing about what's going to happen in the future. Depression tends to be uh, regrets or concerns about what happened in the past. And in both these states of being, we're never in the present. We're either ruminating about the, the future or we're ruminating about the past. And mindfulness and, and, and when we're always in those states of being, right, it becomes nearly impossible to enjoy what's happening now. And so meditation and mindfulness helps to be able to have, have more uh, endurance and the attentional ability, because that's actually what mindfulness is, is building your attention skills so that you can stay in the present uh, and, and, and for longer. And, and there's other aspects of it as well um, that go with it, but it's about reducing judgment. It's about being in the present and it's about accepting what is. Can, can I say something? That was incredible. Thank you so much, Dr. Moore. That was right on the money. That was awesome. Go ahead, Abby. If you don't mind, is that okay, Blaze? If I say something in response to what was, as Keith just said, a really great example and definition of mindfulness and meditation, I, Blaze, am one of those go, go, go types of people. And I just want to say, Bevan, well, I'm a speech therapist and a, and a health coach for care partners. And I think I'll have the opportunity to speak to you guys in a couple months. But I just wanted to say something to you, Bevan, that you recognizing that mindfulness and meditation might be something that could help you is already a first step to trying it, number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, People think of mindfulness and meditation as very woo-woo and too like funky and out there for ourselves. But I will tell you with real assurance and proof that even if you put a free app on your phone to make something feel accountable to you, right? And, and I have started, I started doing it years ago and I can't go to sleep at night unless I select one of these meditations to allow my mind to just succumb to listening to someone else. And I don't have the personality that usually feels that grounded, but as Blaze said, when there's anxiety or frustration or all those other emotions that our brain energy gets sucked into expending, on, we have less room for growing other good parts of our brain's ability. So I just have to 
you know, commend you for recognizing that there's this thing called meditation. It might stink and feel like you hate it when you first do it, which probably means you should do it again and only (laughs) do it for three to five minutes the first time. And you'll be like, wait, even if for five seconds you felt present, that is five good seconds that you didn't feel present before. So just put one of those free apps on your phone. If you want, I can message you, put some in the chat, but I'm sure Blaze, you have a bunch of apps that you recommend people use, but it's well, very quick. helpful. You'll be surprised. And thank you, Abby. Real quick, Blaze and Abby, both of you, um, if you would both email me a few of those, uh, I'll make sure I send it out to everybody uh, when I send out the, the emails, because that's important that we get that information out to everybody. And and the chat is kind of a pain in the ass for me sometimes. So that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Sorry, Bev. I, I always give Bev a hard time because I cuss once in a while. And anyway. <laughs> I, I wanted just to jump in. If, if it's okay, I wanted to say, um, and it, is, it, is it Bevan? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. You said uh, you had mentioned that, you know, uh, sometimes it can be hard um, to stick with something if there's not like a short term goal that you feel like you're accomplishing. And I think that I I, I just wanted to come back to that because I think that's really important. Um, And I think that's a human behavior too, right? If we're not getting sort of like a sense that it's benefiting us, we might, we might leave. So I would say, you know, in terms of short term goals, like thinking, you know, understanding that this is like going to the gym for your attentional muscles and uh, being able to see, you know, if, you know, finding yourself being able to do uh, more minutes for the meditation over time, you know, um, finding that you can be present with maybe it's your breath or, or uh, your focus on something for a longer period of time and building it up that where you can um, find yourself being present or engaged or able to stick with it for a longer period of time and setting little goals for yourself about, you know, about what time, you know, the times that you'd like to, you know, I'll start with two to three minutes and in, in two weeks, I'd like to try and make it up to seven minutes or 10 minutes, you know. Like, it, like is, a, is a reasonable goal, like, um, like let's say. Oh, sorry. I was just wondering what kind of macaroni you want. Really? Go, go ahead, Bevan. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, let's say like, like what a reasonable goal be like. I mean, this is just kind of what I'm thinking. Maybe like, let's say, um, <laughs> let's say like every time, every time I'm, uh, you know, I drive by a police officer or something and my, my heart rate goes up and I'm thinking, uh, you know, what did I, what is he going to pull me over for or something like that? Like, um, uh, as opposed, like, do you think if you if you were if you were able to do like mindfulness long for I mean long enough or or like you know like if you got good at it I guess you let's say or or proficient at it enough that uh, like maybe uh, your your body wouldn't kind of like take over your mind before your mind kind of you know tells the body what to do you know what I'm saying like like tr- like being becoming less hijacked by emotions. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah, I think that's exactly it. I mean, ultimately, what you're doing when you're doing meditation and mindfulness is, is you're training your body to, um, to you're training your body, right? Well, you're training your mind to be able to uh, be stronger at withholding, you know, susceptibility to anxiety and depressive thoughts, right? So whereas like those emotions can get really strong, and then they take over and it's just like the rumination over and over and over again, right? The idea is, is that with meditation and mindfulness is you're, 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 you're training your brain to not, to be able to focus so that like when things like the anxiety related to a police officers by, you're not going to respond, jump to responding to that as quickly, right? There's going to be a sense that you can sort of stay in the present you can challenge the thoughts a, a little bit more. You can also, you know, have more ability to sort of calm yourself down or be able to talk rationally to yourself. 
Um, and that doesn't happen quickly, right? I mean, it takes you yeah. many years to get to a point where you're where you have those responses, and it takes a while to undo those patterns as well. Um, but the idea is that mindfulness over time creates wise mind, right? And wise mind is is equal rational mind and equal emotional mind. So you're not overly rational, but you're not overly emotional. You're sort of utilizing both of those to, to create, uh, you know, wise decisions, uh, you know, thoughtful decisions. Mindfulness um, over time. And then what did you say, Blaze? Uh, said... Mindfulness over, I'm sorry, mindfulness over time. I'm, I'm not sure what I was. Mm, what, I missed, I, I was um, writing as quickly to, to as I sort could. Of like sorry. generate the wise mind, which, which you said was kind of equal parts, uh, emotional and rational brain which makes a lot of sense. Yeah, well, he, he had a comment, but before I do that, Diane had a question too. Oh, I'm, yes, I'm sorry. I just want a question about the chat. Um, for me, I'm a little technologically challenged that I can't read the chat, it's too tiny. Well, um, sometimes we don't have any chat. Um, and a lot of times it's, it's really people that are, are saying, I gotta leave right now. And, stuff like that and just kind of letting me know that Diane oh, um, I if, see if it was something uh, that I needed to bring up to everybody I certainly will do that and uh, and or we'll bring it up um, when I send out the email so um, okay thank you thank you so much so Bevan that was awesome uh, that was you know uh, to me what Bevan's talking about is what a lot of people are you know, go through. And a lot of us wonder, right? <laughs> can, can we, should we, will we <laughs> do that stuff? And it is so critically important, frankly, in my opinion as well. Uh, so thank you, Abby and Blaze on those. Uh, we, we're at 3.53. We got about seven minutes. I love, I love this. This is going great. Is there any other questions for Blaze? Uh, this is really great stuff. Anybody? Well, if, if I can, I let me just. Uh, th this is Jim Lucier, and I'm not. I'm not a stroke person, but I love this. The listening part. I am from Parkinson's uh, Council, and the one things that we talk about a lot with Parkinson's patients is you have a disease, and your disease is real but the stuff in your head is probably not real. It's been put together by you. And now you have to deal with the disease and you have to deal with what you put in your head. Perfect, and, Jim. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I apologize, you know, that's twice. Strike three and I'm out, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, what you said is right on the money. Uh, and it's, we grow up, right? We all grow up in a certain household and we have parents and, you know, some of this is, uh, you know, you guys probably get sick of me saying stuff like this, but, you know, you, you grow up a certain way and you get to a certain age and, and some of that you can blame on your parents, but guess what? We're, we're different now. We are the parents. We are older and we can make choices. We can make the, the decisions to change our own life. And then we get, you know, a stroke or, or Parkinson's or whatever. And um, we still have that choice. And we have to decide for ourselves that it's important. We are important people. You guys, each and every one of you are super important. And find that whatever it is. And, and start moving that direction. It's going to take time. It's going to be a lot of damn hard work. And, uh, but, but you know what? It is what it is. And so we got to keep moving. Um, sorry, Blaze. I've had a couple of commercial breaks there that I've, I've came oh, in on. Great. Good I'm stuff. very, very passionate about this, this group. So go ahead, buddy. Any, anything else? Oh, me? Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't, I, I guess I don't know. Um, 
I'm trying to think, is there any, yeah, I mean, is there anything related to self strategies or things that people want to know about? Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, that's okay. I don't really know what else to, what else to, to talk about. I don't know if there's a, a topic well, we, that we want to finish off with or. Yeah, we only have three minutes. And so, um, you know, I appreciate it very much. Um, <laughs> some other folks got to run and stuff, but uh, it's been awesome having you, Blaze. And, and this one, you know, the last time we had a, an agenda, didn't we? We had it, <laughs> you know, we knew right where we were going that first meeting we had. And this one was kind of a open-ended. And frankly, I like the open-ended stuff because then people can come up with questions and, and whatever the topic might be. Um, and so I thought it was really great. Uh, hey, Lane, how are you? I am so sorry. I was stuck in a business meeting trying to jump on here. Uh, well, I'll be sending the recording out anyway, so you'll get that. Great. And uh, Bill, it's great to see you. Hi, Lene. Yeah, I met Bill the other day. Great guy. So thanks for jo joining. Oh, Harold, this is cool. <laughs> All kinds of people. So this is great. So I apologize for being late and I'll watch the recording. That's awesome. So nice to see you, Lonnie. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I can't even say, you know, we're so thankful for all of you guys. Um, you guys have created a very good meeting where we have good topics and uh, a lot of good conversation. And it, it's awesome. Um, any other questions before we, before we dive off of here? Hey, Keith. Yeah, John. John. I have something I noticed because the thing, and I think he's logged off. I don't see Bevan on anymore. Yeah. Um, I looked it up. He's got a book out on this. You know that? I do. Okay. I, I didn't, I, maybe I was the only one, but I had no idea. I looked at a few pages on it. It looked like it was a good read. It, it is a good read. Um, it's a little uh, different. It goes, you know, uh, a few different spots, but it's really good. And one of the, you know, you bring up a great point, John. We all, no matter what we've done out there, we all go through times and things that, you know, create different struggles. And, and um, it doesn't matter how successful you are or, or aren't or whatever. We all go through ups and downs. And this support group, is perfect for that exact reason uh, because we can all hear and I you know I want to make sure I say this too it's so good to be honest and truthful about things and to come out with some of the things you got somebody like Dr. Morrison sitting here uh, it's good for us to be able to say things he's not getting paid he's he's doing this out mm -hmm. of the goodness of his heart mm -hmm. I don't know if he knows that but <laughs> <laughs> I, the checks in the mail right the checks in the mail <laughs> but you know it, it's awesome and um and we love you for it buddy and um you know well i just i i care about all of you so much i and i think you guys all know that so uh any other quick questions and we're going to jump off here thank you so much dr morrison well, yeah, thank you. I just want to say thanks, everyone, for having me. And, uh, you know, and of course, I'd love to, you know, come back and uh, do it again. So I appreciate what you all do. Well, we'll do that. And the next time we do one, uh, we'll we'll get a topic put in place for you uh, that'll help. But I thought it was a really good meeting. I thought we had a lot of great conversation. And so thank you, each and every one of you. I appreciate every every one of you guys. And I uh, couple of weeks, I think it's September. Oh, let me look. September 13th. Oh, real quick. Anybody have a stroke anniversary this month? Good. Okay, okay. Cool. Oh, Diane. September. Yeah, mine's September as well. I think yeah. mine is, this is my second this month. Oh, um, wow. Good. Well, I, I hope you celebrate. Yes. <laughs> just remember <laughs> keep up the great work all of you guys look forward to seeing you on the next one september 13th mm -hmm. 
and uh, it'll be a great meeting. So talk to you all soon. Thanks, Keith. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Hey, everybody. Dan, right?